Services Manager at Grantmakers, and I'll be starting us off today. So some background. Today's webinar is part of our seven-part fundamentals series. Now, whether you're new to philanthropy or a seasoned professional committed to continuing education, our fundamental series will provide opportunities to establish and or deepen your skills, as well as your relationships with colleagues and your peers. So I will be starting us off with a few housekeeping elements. <clears throat> Excuse me, number one, just a heads up that throughout the webinar, we welcome questions on the bottom of the screen. You'll see where it says chat. Feel free to type your questions in there and we will leave them through today's conversation. Number two, we'll be recording the webinar so you'll have an opportunity to access what's discussed and the content and resources which will be provided uh, in a link in the follow-up email. Third, at the end of, towards the end of the webinar rather, during our closing remarks, we will add an evaluation poll in the chat box. And Sandy Grantmakers appreciates your support. By It'll provide valuable feedback that will help us to improve future programming. So I just want to thank you now for taking a minute or two to complete the poll later. And fourth, fourthly, if that's a word, I want to start with some brief introductions in alphabetical order by first name, if you can kindly share your name, um, the organization with, that you're with, that you are with, as well as respond to the question, what experience with collaboration is. And so I have the registration list ahead of me. Before I jump into that, I will start um, by sharing my experience with collaboration. And that has been as a grant writer, um, mostly with government proposals, not exclusively, but government proposals definitely required a lot of And in my previous role with the San Diego LGBT Center, we Home Start San Diego, San Diego Youth Services, and other organizations committed to addressing youth homelessness. And that was my intro. Now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to the uh, list I have here on the participants, I'm gonna go ahead and um, start it off with Megan. I see, go ahead and share with you. Uh, sh sure, yeah. Hi, Megan Thomas. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think I know everybody um, here, but I'm the Vice President of Collaboration and Special Initiatives. Uh, and all I do is collaborate with all of you. Uh, and it has made me uh, smarter, happier, and more connected and I'm excited to talk more about it um, after the duration of this program. Thanks, Carlos. Absolutely. And I'm going to ask if I can please, um, 619-886 number. It looks like it's 986. Oh. Last three, six, Sorry, I don't know. If, that's me or not. If, if there's only one person on the phone, that's, that would be me. Um, Joe Gavin, the Chief Program and Community Engagement Officer for the San Diego Seniors Community Foundation. My role is to uh, act as the foundation's representative in, co in collaborating, connecting with the various nonprofit uh, senior organizations in San Diego, as well as the over 25 senior centers, in an effort to, uh, to continue to build an infrastructure that will support seniors now and in the future. Thank you, Joe. And I did see another number on here. The last four digits are one, eight. Oh, sorry. That could be me. Go ahead. Is that, is it 818? Feel free, kick it off. Yeah, it's, hi, sorry. I had to switch my phone. It's Ali Barron with Hope and Heal Fund. Um, I am our development communications officer. We are a state-based donor collaborative fund uh, that supports, um, and takes a public health approach to gun violence prevention strategies uh, through a very heavily based racial equity framework and lens. Thank you, Allie. And I did see a one more person calling in on a phone number. And it's in one eight three six. Good afternoon. That's J.R. Rains. I'm with the MUFG Union Bank Foundation. And as always, uh, with collaborations, looking for best practices. On the participant list, Sorry. 
And then, um, uh, let's see and then uh, Pam, if you can please share with us a brief intro and then your experience with collaboration. Check back in in two shakes. I also um, want to check. Welcome, Debbie. We're just doing a quick intro and then our experience with collaboration. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good to be here. Um, spent most of my uh, working field collaborating. I think it's critically important and the way that we really build up solutions that um, have the uh, wisdom of everyone involved. I'm looking forward to today's conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Debbie. And next, I'm going to ask for uh, Chris Bronner. Quick introduction, please. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I just arrived, but um, um, I'm Crystal Bronner. I'm with Dr. Bronner's Family Foundation, and um, we uh, have a, a special fund project um, called the Mega Justice Initiative that focuses on the needs of refugees in um, immigrant communities and um, marginalized communities. Um, Good to be with y'all. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. And we were just doing a few introductory remarks about folks' experiences with collaboration, but it sounds like that work, particularly in San Diego, does require a great deal of collaboration. Um, oh, was that a question? Sorry. To share that, that was my kind of musings on what you uh, on what you shared. So thank you, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And then next, uh, Debbie Anderson. Hello there. I'm Debbie Anderson with the Rancho Santa Fe Foundation and um, our military focus program area, the Patriots Connection. Um, I sit on the Military Funders Collaborative and for several years was also on the Food Funders uh, Working Group. Um, an excellent experience there, but we shifted our focus away from uh, senior meals, which is what we were doing, and so I stepped down from that working group. They're still doing fabulous work, and now there's some overlap going on with food funders and military funders, which is also a pretty exciting thing. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate that. And actually, I want to uh, ask if we can have an introduction from your colleague on the military funders group, Gordon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gordon Swanson. Um, I recently termed out as a director of the Rancho Santa Fe Foundation, <clears throat> but still find myself uh, involved with them a little bit uh, as they're working on a new strategic plan, which is kind of exciting. And I'm also a uh, director of the Parker Foundation, <clears throat> which is active in a number of different collaborations and the collaboration which attempts to participate in the military and vendor part of uh, uh, what we do is uh, my responsibility and I have worked with uh, a number of the people on this call of the military funder, funders group. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. And next I'm gonna ask for a brief intro from Robert. There, Robert Foster, Director of Impact Investments at San Diego Grantmakers. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with collaboratives for, for years uh, with federal government, foundations, and Fortune 100 corporations. Um, and uh, one of the things that I was just absolutely compelling about joining the team here at San Diego Grantmakers is the, the work that, that we lead, especially Megan Thomas leads, uh, around collaboratives. Um, there, there is a fine art to doing this, and I'm, I'm, I'm constantly learning from Megan and what she does, and I'm inspired by the work that that Grant Makers does to move the de move the needle for San Diego as a whole. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate that. And if we can please get a brief introduction from Patricia. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Patricia Sinai, and I'm a 
a nonprofit and philanthropic consultant. I, um, until recently, was a corporate giving person for Holland America Line. Um, but obviously, with a lot of the stuff going on with the cruise industry, we had to cut our corporate giving program here in San Diego. I am one of the founders of um, Latina Give San Diego, and I'm working with San Diego grant makers on their um, financial funders, uh, financial immigration funders <laughs> group. And my background on collaboration has really been almost my whole entire career. Um, usually facilitating, playing that role of bringing in the different partners and trying to find out where the strengths are and trying to um, leave egos at the door and find the best way to move forward. Thanks. Well put. Thank you, Patricia. And I believe I got everyone on the list. Did I um, happen to miss anyone or didn't give anyone a chance to introduce themselves? Oh, sorry. First. I saw you on the list and I thought I said your name. So welcome, Laura. Brief introduction, please. Um, hello. Sorry, I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm on video here. Um, I'm Laura Rareman. I'm with uh, San Diego uh, Social Venture Partners. Uh, and uh, we're about to start, as a matter of fact, today, a uh, uh, cycle uh, with uh, two new investees, uh, Kitchens for Good and outdoor outreach and I'll be working with Kitchens for Good. So I'm looking for kind of some, some tips and, and thoughts uh, uh, how I can uh, uh, work with them as far as uh, uh, collaboratives um, back in my days in uh, DC with a nonprofit uh, Center for Climate Energy Solutions. We did a lot of strategic partnerships with uh, other nonprofits, corporations um, and universities. So uh, interested to hear today's conversation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura. And last but certainly not least is our friend, Pam Gabriel. Yes, good afternoon. I sincerely apologize, I believe, when you called on me. I wasn't sure if it was another Pam, but thank you so much for having me here. Pamela Gabriel with Bank of America. I just truly absolutely appreciate everything that San Diego Grantmakers does and I'm part of the Bank of America Foundation and we take a look at different ways of collaborating throughout San Diego just to increase our impact in whatever it may be, most specifically around economic mobility for Bank of America and so I'm looking forward to hearing what the conversation is about today. Wonderful, thank you Pam and we have a lot of great content. Today, we'll begin with some reflections and perspectives from current members of the funding collaborative at uh, San Diego Grantmakers, who introduced themselves earlier, the Military Funders Group, that began in 2011 to help military and veteran families in San Diego and Imperial Counties. So uh, joining us today on the call are Debbie Anderson and Gordon Swanson, who are on that group, and who will share their experiences with the Military Funders Group, talk a little bit about funding reads across America, and also share a few perspectives and reflections. So uh, Debbie, why don't we go ahead and start it off with you. Thanks, Carlos, I appreciate that. Um, I've been involved with the Military Funders Group since the beginning, and our very first project was the Military Family Support Working, uh, the Military Family, Military uh, MTSP, Megan, help me. Um, which <laughs> I know. Transition support project. Thank you. Um, which uh, became 0800. Um, and 0800 is quite the going concern now. As a matter of fact, this year they became their own 501c3. And that is um, a program we're really, really proud of. Um, the military funders and lots of community members came together from all the sectors to um, stand up that organization. And um, once we did that, the military funders then uh, looked back to each other and said, what do we do next? And we've looked at a number of different things. Um, some things that we learned about, we realized we couldn't move the needle on, so we moved on to other things. And our most recent project has been to come together with our funding 
to help two organizations, Interfaith Community Services and PATH, by hiring or funding for them a veteran housing navigator. And we're in year two of a two-year commitment there, which is going really well. And we're proud of that as well. Um, now we're starting to look at food insecurity for military families and veterans. And that's where our work is crossing over with um, the uh, Food Funders Group. So at one of our meetings, when we were sharing what each of the organization is up to, um, I, I announced, as we each do, that our funding cycle was open and we were accepting applications. And Gordon um, said, well, maybe you could tell us what your top 10 are, because I had about 50 applications or so. And he said, tell me what your top 10 are, and maybe Parker can help out with some of those. And at the same time, Dan Bentema from the USS Midway Foundation said the same thing. Well, you know, there might be some crossover here and maybe we can work together on some of these. So what ended up happening is that the Parker Foundation um, co-funded a couple of grants with us and uh, that allowed us to fund uh, more organizations that we ordinarily wouldn't have been able to fund. And the Midway Foundation um, for two years now has come alongside us to help fund a matching program that we have with Reese Across America, where um, we offer to the community an opportunity to match every wreath that a donor would like to purchase. So um, we put in um, $5,000, that's all we put in each year. And the Midway Foundation for the last two years has put in one year five and last year 75. Mm -hmm. And that then turns into this matching campaign. And for every wreath that's ordered, we match that with $15 to buy another wreath. And that collaboration has resulted in um, over $30,000 raised to support Reese Across America. Last year, it was nearly 35000 So that's been a very successful collaboration, as has been the collaboration with Parker on the two grants that we funded a couple of years ago. Um, Gordon, would you like to talk a little bit about how uh, Parker has been working with us on those grants? Well, you just gave my presentation. No, I'm just <laughs> I, I'd like to maybe just sort of step back and maybe talk about how how collaborations work well versus those that may not. And, and what I found is there's there's a lot of us out there with funds, and we like to find the right home for it, but sometimes finding the right home is not that easy. And what I found important was a combination of putting those funds together with people who are good at what they do, with people who have the requisite information to know what to do. And I think that's what I found in um, working with Debbie over the years, that she and her colleagues working on the Patriots Connection had developed this information or data uh, over the years, which was really um, of value to not only to the Rancho Santa Fe Foundation, but potential others who were interested in this sector. And I, I think um, while they were able to specialize and build this data up over a number of years, when we had a, uh, people at the Parker Foundation who were working on a bunch of different collaboratives, it was just, we just couldn't replicate the same thing that they had done. So by working together and then reaching out to others, almost like a, like a banking syndicate, I sort of come from the banking industry, we were really able to put together a program that was, uh, was very uh, effective. And I think one of the things we learned when we did the 0800 situation, it was almost like we had all these veterans on one side of the river 
and we had all the potential benefits on the other side of the river. And we're trying to figure out well, how can we put these two groups together? And the key was not just having people who wanted to help, but people who were trusted. They were trusted because they were not only knowledgeable, but in many cases they were veterans. And when you became a trusted navigator, it made all the difference. So I, I see sort of going forward this sort of combination of capital, trusted navigators, and information used in a way that's um, accretive and positive for all parties. So that's my two, my two cents. That was one very well put, Gordon and Debbie. Thank you both very much for sharing, again, your reflections and perspectives. And next, I'd like to hand it over to Megan Thomas, who you all met earlier during our introduction, and who will guide today's conversation. So I'm going to hand it over to Megan, but also a friendly reminder to everyone else that, uh, to please add any questions into the chat box, and we'll weave them into today's conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for sharing, and Debbie and Gordon um, for coming here to share with this group a little bit of what you've experienced. Um, and, and I heard a couple of folks in their introductions talk about um, learning and listening uh, and seeing what we are going to provide today. And I just want to invite everybody into this conversation. Um, at, when I look at the names uh, on the screen here and the faces that we've seen, you all are what makes collaboration. And so let's try and make this a collaborative conversation. Uh, I will speak for maybe not even 10 minutes, maybe five minutes over a couple of slides, and then really wanted to take the opportunity to just have a, have a dialogue um, about a few prompts about some of the key uh, support factors, the key, key factors of success around collaboration. Um, and I, I'll start with a story and then, and, I, and while I'm doing that, maybe Carlos, you can switch over to the slides. Uh, I am a, about a four and a half year uh, veteran of San Diego Grand Makers. I started in late 2015, uh, having come from the nonprofit sector. Um, and I had worked there for about 15 years prior. Uh, and this was a new job at the time. It's called Senior Director of Collaborative Philanthropy and was described as uh, facilitating a half a dozen or so groups of funders who wanted to fund around the same areas. And I thought, wow, this is a really good fit for what I want to do with my career. And it sounds super easy. There's just funders sitting around a table, kind of got their checkbooks open, and they're just waiting uh, to all kind of write that check and put it in a pool. And we're going to make all these grants. And it's just going to be like the best. Uh, and for all of you who have been involved in some sort of collaborative funding effort, you likely know that that was a little bit of uh, a, a rosy view <laughs> on how, how this all works. Uh, it, it is not that folks aren't ready, primed, and um, eager to do that collaborative funding, but there is uh, a, a long list of things that need to be gotten through. Some of them are just simply relationship and trust building, just in the way that we talk about doing with our grantees. Uh, and others are really structural, institutional uh, things related to grant cycles or um, approval processes and those sorts of things. And so as, as we've gone forward, I think all of us collectively have learned how to navigate those. Uh, and when uh, shortcuts we can take for speed, uh, and when it's really worthwhile to invest a lot of time and effort to come out with something um, really remarkable for the community. And I would say, you know, in the time that I've been with the organization, um, so say less than five years, we've been able to do something in the neighborhood of, I think, 4.2, maybe $4.3 million in collaborative funding collectively. Uh, and that, you know, money is not the only thing that matters, but I think that is a good way to um, sort of a proxy for the impact, right? Is saying we've been able to come together and make those decisions and move funding in a way that it wouldn't otherwise have made. Um, Any time with the slides, thanks, Carlos. Uh, the other thing I notice about this group and is really exciting is 
that we have a, a wide representation of uh, sort of classifications of philanthropists and funders, right? We heard from um, Joe at the Community Foundation. We've got uh, Chris from uh, a family foundation. We've got some corporate uh, with JR. Patricia is representing um, corporate and the giving circle. We've got a pooled fund and uh, some private foundations. And this is, you know, sort of some of the, I think, beauty of philanthropy is that we all make up this mosaic of funding streams and intents and purposes and missions um, just as diverse as the community that we serve. Uh, and it also makes for a really dynamic uh, uh, process and conversation when we get together and try to collaborate and do collaborate successfully. Uh, and you know, it, it causes some challenges that need to be worked through that I a little bit mentioned earlier, but it also really offers some opportunities and that we can leverage different strengths, uh, you know, where uh, some folks have restrictions and some don't, where some folks can time, um, some folks can go to their board and seek flexibility. There's really no one right way to do collaboration. And I think if you walk away uh, uh, or, you know, click away <laughs> from this meeting with, no other lesson it would be that however you're doing collaboration right now or however you're thinking about doing it um, is probably the right way uh, we have some uh, we have some principles that we operate around that we think can extend or accelerate your collaboration that can make it easier um, or more impactful but just in the way that we're navigating relationships and structures and institutions all the time Collaboration looks a lot of different ways. And at San Diego Grantmakers, uh, we've really embraced that. Um, so this, the, the slide that you're looking at right now is the Guide to Collaborative Philanthropy that we published um, a few years ago. It, it's due for, uh, and somewhere on the list of things we're working on, an update uh, to reflect uh, where we've come since then. But um, our goal really is to support your collaboration in whatever way it looks uh, and to tap into a broad network of other relationships that we have to make it more effective uh, because we really think that um, there are sort of concentric circles rings of collaboration that's going to be within your institution or your family and that's going to then go out to other funders but then we need to be talking to the community members and nonprofit groups and to government and to to businesses to really get at the level of change that we need to see as a community because none of us wants to be a band-aid and a lot of times those are necessary we need to feed people but we also need folks to um, be able to feed themselves right and as we're looking at where our, our country is today it's um, really evident that there are some big structural challenges in terms of um, how money moves how systems reward and punish people and we can pull out data that points to who is most um, uh, advantaged and who's most disadvantaged. So if we could go to the, oh, so this is the guide. Um, it is online and there, you can navigate to it on our website and I have a link at the end um, if you want to kind of cruise through it. Um, we're not gonna kind of walk through it today and I welcome any sort of reference to it or conversation after the fact or anything, but we're gonna focus on those key success factors. Uh, but Carlos, if you go to the next slide, I do want to ground us in um, this one sort of concept, which is to say not only is there no one right way to do collaboration, but even any individual effort probably looks a little different at given points in time and probably loops back on itself and go a variety of cycles. Um, so that imaginary world that I uh, uh, you know, came in thinking was going to be reality was one in which all we ever did was act. <laughs> all we ever did was sit down, make a decision, write a check, and move on to the next um, sort of uh, uh, challenge in, in the community place for funding. When in reality, uh, there, we don't generally make decisions that way as people, as funders, um, or, or as you know, just a, a community. We absorb information, uh, use some sort of filters to, uh, and, and consultation to make decisions about it. We think about what the outcome is going to be and then we try to map our influence into achieving that outcome. So 
at this moment in time, we have probably eight or 10 different collaboratives uh, going on. And they range from funders only to nonprofits only to uh, really cross sector efforts that involve government and investors and businesses. Um, and they are, exist right now in all of these phases and some of them are in multiple at the same time. Uh, you know, Gordon and Debbie are both a part of the military funders group and they do in fact have a, they're in an act <laughs> phase with the veteran homelessness grants that are out. Uh, and we're also learning uh, about other issues and thinking through how to not only support uh, veterans and military connected families who are homeless, but thinking about their lives holistically. So what happens to them in other phases and um, areas of their lives. So usually what uh, we ask for folks who want to do a collaborative that is supported by grant makers, um, and, and I should mention that that's kind of where we come in, is to, is to say, uh, as I mentioned, our, our role, our goal is to help amplify and accelerate how this work can happen. Uh, because we have the capacity and experience and network of relationships to be able to um, help you through these different phases and to be able to connect and communicate with everybody who's there to make sure that we're all in alignment and moving forward together. Um, so we generally ask uh, the sort of leaders um, or initiators of the group to have a little bit of an idea of where they want to get to and a commitment to building the relationships and sustaining the collaboration for long enough to get there. Um, and in my experience, that takes roughly 18 to 24 months if you're coming in mostly with an idea and a commitment, but without um, other sort of structural, structured conversation that you've had around that. Um, that's not to say we can't act more quickly. Uh, and when things happen that require a rapid response, that's something that you know, we can help you through as well. Uh, but for this longer term systemic kind of um, solution oriented grant making, that's about the timeline. Um, so a good example of learn and plan, uh, I would say is what Debbie described with the Military Transition Support Project. Uh, that group spent about a year gathering um, and conversing between a uh, whole and add the military into these different cross sector groups and you get a whole other dynamic um, to just figure out what they could do. What was a gap in the overall system of support for folks who are um, currently or had been in the military service and their families. Um, they knew that's who they wanted to help, uh, but didn't know where to go. And so through that process, those relationships were built and that um, confidence in the effectiveness of the group developed and they identified uh, the period of transition from about six months prior to separation to about a year or so after someone had left active duty service. And from there, uh, the planning about how to approach that, the development of the peer navigator model emerged, some funding um, came down and they were able to actually act on that. Uh, we're very proud of that program alongside a whole um, host of others. But as you can see, then, now that that work is really sustaining itself in many ways, it, in as much so as a nonprofit can do um, uh, through relationships and fundraising and planning of their own, uh, the funders came back and did some more learning uh, and then moved into planning and acting. And so there's nothing wrong with sort of ebbing and flowing. And we just are always carefully monitoring the, um, you know, is there kind of a, a viable product there? Is this still, amplifying your impact, becoming something that makes you more effective at achieving your mission, um, and for us collectively to answer the interests and the needs in the community. Carlos, can we go to the next slide? So before we get into conversation, uh, I just wanted to share, and hopefully this will work, otherwise I have a link that I will send to Carlos, but a video uh, that was prepared uh, of some of our members talking about their connection to collaboration. No good? Let me send you this link. Boop, boop. Actually, let's do this.
I need to get the Jeopardy music on cue for moments like this. Setting it up right now. Thank y'all. Oh, well, so let me prime your thinking then while he's setting that up. Um, where we'll go next is just to talk about these key elements of success. And we have, we identify, you know, there, there are lots of things that need to happen, but we identify three in particular that are really critical. Uh, one is a supportive climate with strong interpersonal networks. So that means we need to be connected to one another. Right, and we need to be in an environment in which we can maintain and build on that connection, uh, because at the end of the day, it really is about trusting relationships and a system that allows us to stay connected in our purpose um, and in whatever needs each has. Because if your needs aren't being met as an individual funder, uh, then it's harder to maintain that central um, core of, of collaborative action. The second is a credible champion with time, energy, and resources. Um, one of the things that we recognize it, and part of the role that San Diego Grantmakers plays is that we can be that sort of that fulcrum, that hub from which the collabor collaboration emanates that's keeping track of and in connection with everybody involved. Uh, but to go out into the community and really talk about this work, there needs to be some sort of peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication to sort of rally the troops, as it were. Um, and also, it's just much more effective to have you out there talking about your own work rather than us referencing you um, sort of as a third party. Um, and that helps keep motivation high and the commitment coming back to the table. And the last thing we call a ripe or unusual opportunity. Uh, so that really means this is something that isn't already being done. Um, and that might mean that it's, it could be done better that would be sort of a ripe opportunity to build um, on and, and um, transform the solution that's at hand. Uh, or it might be a gap. You know, we're always, uh, one thing I think is universal is that we love our landscape scans, our asset maps. We, we want to know what are the needs, what are the responses, and what isn't being done that would make this situation better. And so when we find those, um, that's a really good place to build on a collaboration. Carlos, are we ready? I would say the value of collaboration is important in philanthropy and with philanthropy to me personally, because as I think of San Diego, I think of a region that thrives when many of us are together around the table, trying to figure out how to focus on something that, that moves the community forward. When we're at our weakest, it's because uh, one individual organization or one individual is trying to steer an idea without pulling the rest of the community in. And so in many ways, the collaboration that I see is so critical to economic development efforts in San Diego and education efforts in San Diego and workforce development efforts in San Diego, so much of it centrally comes back to trusted partners in and around philanthropy. Well, I think, think through collaboration, um, uh, funders can learn from each other um, and can, can better understand the, the complex issues that we're trying to address are, are generally beyond the scope of any one of our, our missions, our area of expertise, the resources that we have. And, and by uh, working together, learning together, and, and um, hopefully developing strategies that we, we can share towards a common goal, we can be more effective in the work that we're trying to do. Collaboration is very important to the work we do here at San Diego Grantmakers. It allows funders to learn together about their topic of interest and then either to pool or align resources in order to make investments in the community. And that collaborative funding can be much more impactful. One of the things that I think is key to helping philanthropy move our region is around communication. I've long you know, felt that the vehicle of San Diego Grantmakers provides that to us. 
us. Oftentimes, I don't think some of the philanthropic organizations in San Diego know what's happening in all corners of the community, and I don't think all corners of the community know and understand who is out there in the philanthropic space. So that dialogue is so critical because oftentimes there's like-minded efforts in the region that aren't meeting up with each other. The more we talk to each other, the more we invite each other into rooms, the more we sit around tables and have these discussions, then the more we have opportunities to connect with the individuals and organizations that want to move things in a certain direction and make sure we align the resources where and when we can. much uh, we switch back to the slideshow and just go to that last slide yeah um, here are those questions so I just wanted to open it up and um, uh, just have a conversation with folks uh, about where you're seeing uh, strengths or opportunities uh, where you see places that we might um, identify one of these elements that could help us move into a collaborative space, or even just reflecting on some of the work that you're doing now. We have a couple of folks from our binational migration funders um, on this call. We have a couple of folks from our military funders, um, and I think I've interacted with each and every one of you in some collaborative, um, sort of writ large fashion, um, or challenges that you're having and you'd like to use the wisdom of the group over the next 15 minutes or so to dive into that. So if anybody would like to start with a, a reflection, uh, a question or um, uh, a, a claim, if you wanna share some of your wisdom and expertise, we'd love to hear it. If I can't, one of, um, at the last, um, by natural funders group by natural migration funders group one of the questions that came up was there's a lot of intersection among the different um, yeah. groups especially right now when you're looking at covid and um the other you know and racism and so the group obviously with when it comes to immigration where we have a lens to look at the, at some of that work you know, looking at the racial aspects of it and the ethnic, but we were really curious on how the other groups um, are are looking at the ethnic and racial um, data and kind of really going into the heart of the issues versus just sol you know, solving the starfish that are on the beach right now. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, what do folks, folks think about that? I heard two things there. One is this idea that um, uh, you know, n really nobody's experiencing a single issue. If, if you have hunger, there's probably something else going on. Um, and just as individuals, we have multiple identities. I am a woman, I am white, I have a class, I have a geographic location. Um, and so uh, the idea that we can solve one issue without really acknowledging the others um, is, is one thing to raise. Um, and then the other of this sort of short-term, long-term current needs and long-term solutions. Well, what are some of the current uh, projects that folks are working on or, or struggling with? I, I know SVP, for example, has a unique model in which it offers um, uh, sort of skilled assistance alongside funding and has worked, um, I think, on a recent collaboration with another organization to co-fund, right? The Women's Foundation, maybe? Um, I believe that's right. Um, on the, I mean, Patricia raises a, a good point that uh, everything right now is, we're looking at it through a new lens, perhaps, of uh, racial injustice and uh, COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. 
And it's, you know, with SVP, it was interesting that we, you know, back in January, we made our decision of what would we focus on for this next kind of funding and uh, volunteer cycle. And we chose uh, income inequality, which, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's sort of a perfect topic with, uh, you know, the, the folks most affected by uh, the virus are the folks at the lower end of, you know, the, the economic uh, uh, chain here. Um, and there's obviously racial disparities uh, when it comes to the, to the impact of the virus. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if I coined the phrase, but I said, you know, uh, income inequality is an underlying uh, pre-existing condition you know, basically. Mm. <laughs> um, so I, um, and, you know, starting to have some conversations. I, I also, I'm tied still to kind of the environmental community uh, back East and have started having some conversations with them about looking at, you know, our own organizations uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to racial injustice mm -hmm. and, you know, I was on a call and we were talking about the environment and we had the little squares up and we're all white. It's like, hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like that doesn't seem right. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, as funders and as nonprofits, we need to have two lenses. First is look inward at ourselves uh, and then uh, also look and see what are these uh, pre-existing conditions of racial injustice uh, that uh, an income inequality that we need to factor into whatever the work is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to, to toss out a potentially naive question. Uh, to, Wonderful. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's, um, I, I've uh, had a little bit of, of activ activity and volunteering with certain groups when it comes to the immediate impact of, uh, of hunger and, you know, feeding people. And it, you know, you don't have to be around long to realize, wow, there are a lot of different groups that are feeding people. You know, there's, there's different food banks and there's Feeding San Diego and, um, you know, Kitchens for Good is doing some of it. And then there's, you know, Armed Services, YMCA. Right. You know, I mean, there's probably a hundred places that are, you know, trying to, to, do this and I, I would have to think there's some duplication of effort and I'm wondering if there's been any discussion about being more collaborative uh, when it comes to meeting the immediate need of hunger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about um, collaboration within the nonprofit sector and then just kind of across the board? Yeah, I guess either uh, collaboration among the nonprofits, which of course, you know, they each have their own, uh, uh, you know, folks that they're helping. They each have their own probably competing fun funders, so that gets probably problematic. Um, uh, so I'm also then wondering, have funders thought about, you know, how can we not have such a potentially overlapping or piecemeal kind of competitive approach to feeding mm -hmm. people. Yeah, I have um, plenty of thoughts on that, but would open it up to the group. And maybe uh, if you have experience in any sort of issue area in terms of this conundrum of lots of folks doing important work, um, but seemingly not totally coordinated for that level of efficiency on impact, um, how you got there, or what the challenges were, or what the solutions were. Well, I can share a little bit. Um, so this is a question that has come up for our uh, San Diego Food Funders group. Uh, and you know, there's sort of a structure like with anything, there's specialty, right? So Feeding San Diego and the food bank um, are kind of the big, uh, they're the food banks, right? They, they have the food. And then all the ones you hear about that are actually feeding people directly are they call them pantries or something like that. So the food banks distribute to those pantries. 
Um, and the idea is to get, um, you know, so much of this, um, like, trust, uh, reaching all of the people in need and doing so in a dignified way is about identifying trusted messengers. And so we might need a church and a community group and uh, I don't know, a daycare provider or something to all be distributing food to the folks who trust them. Uh, but certainly figuring out how to make that efficient and how to make sure everybody has what they need. Um, how do we get fresh produce to people if some don't have the ability to refrigerate, for example, um, is all uh, very challenging. I know within the uh, folks serving, you I think you mentioned the Armed Services YMCA, so folks serving military families, there has recently, and I don't know, it may have been disrupted by the COVID um, experience, but there had been a nascent effort to get everybody in that landscape together to do exactly what you're talking about. And one thing that I would say is a really good place for funder collaboratives is to fund those efforts, uh, because we know that there is always a challenge in identifying resources for almost any nonprofit and to be able to um, find a grant that says specifically, yeah, sure, you could sit around and talk um, for the year plus it'll probably take to build trust and start to try things out is a really good place, I think, for funder collaboratives to come in because it's not any one, um, you know, I, I would say the Parker Foundation does a particularly good job and, and probably some others at funding these sort of infrastructure unsexy type of things, right? sitting around and talking, having improved um, computer system, those sorts of things. But in as much as it takes us as a sector, time and effort uh, to get to a place where we can collaborate, we have to recognize that that's also true for the nonprofits and understand that there, the outcomes are gonna be, we had you know 12 meetings this year. <laughs> it's not gonna be, we changed the face of um, hunger. Uh, but that's a really great question you raise about how do we support um, nonprofits in being more coordinated when we know that um, I would say in some ways we are uh, reinforcing that competitive funding landscape in the way that we issue funds and say we have X amount of funds all of you submit applications and we'll choose one uh, maybe there are other ways to think about how we even do that so that they have the incentive to be collaborative maybe I <coughs> Megan if I can make a suggestion please <coughs> that, uh, you know, there's obviously a need for all the funders to think collaboratively. But maybe there's a difference when between we define a certain collaboration and, and, and it has sort of a, a life unto its own. Mm -hmm. we, we all pull together on this particular collaborative, which is different than maybe trying to create a, uh, um, a cloud database of information and you know grant makers might be a great opportunity to do that so that when anybody does anything in, in the nonprofit sector it's information is shared and and then someone like yourself uh, and like this organization can sort of look at that information at 35,000 feet and and sort of Put, put people together who perhaps should be. Mm. Uh, because one of the problems I have is that I've seen many collaboratives, you know, the, you know, the, the goal is so big that the, sometimes they just don't make any progress. They just have meetings. Yeah. I find that they're very frustrating. Yeah. But, but at the same time, I think there's an opportunity here uh, to share information that's, that's not being done effectively. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, absolutely. And we are thinking along those lines and maybe could use the last few minutes um, of this session. And Carlos, you can go back to the full screen so we can see everybody. Um, to hear from you, thing, things of that nature. Uh, San Diego Grantmakers has been in a, a business model um, process, uh, trying to understand where is the value that we bring and what else or what more or what differently could we be doing to make these connections and identify those solutions that we can all rally around. Uh, we think of it sort of shorthand internally, we talk about a network of networks. Um, and I think having access to that data plus helping bring folks together around a um, solutions mindset, uh, but 
but um, without the constraints of any one particular problem uh, is kind of where that's going. And so what are, if you had, you know, just one thing that you would share of, we really wish that somebody would do X, Y, and Z and San Diego Grantmakers seems well suited, for example, having this data, data bank. Um, I would love to hear that from you all. I think sometimes um, I see San Diego grant records as a facilitator and, 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 and as a consultant myself, I feel like facilitators need to um, ask the tough questions and, and, mm -hmm. and put a mirror up sometimes versus, you know, um, going back to Gordon, you know, there's different phases of collaboration and we all throw that word around without understanding that there is a whole um, spectrum of collaboration from associations to all the way to mergers. And, and so that's one piece. But I think um, right now we're at a tipping point and San Diego grant makers can play that role as a respected person to ask some of the tough questions mm -hmm. like, you know, or allow their members to ask some of the tough questions to get some of the legitimate data, like around living wage issues. I mean, I've facilitated board retreats at a job um, organization, and they got mad at me because I brought up living wage and they saw it as political mm -hmm. versus that should be going to the mission. So just helping people understand this is your mission, be it in a foundation or a nonprofit. What does that mean to actually see it? it see it change and you're no longer in business how do we have that conversation about how do we what is our goal in getting out of business what would be successful thank you maybe maybe one more um, remark and then we'll wind down ali i know you're collaborating that's the whole nature of your work or um joe if you're still with us i think you are having built a foundation from the ground up. <laughs> Sorry, Megan, I, I, you, this is a bit jumbled. Did you um, ask, ask me something? This is Joe. Oh, I was just wondering if you had any insights having built a foundation sort of from the ground up into what it takes to be collaborative and where SDG could provide additional or different support um, to make it easier or more effective. Yeah, so I mean, it's obviously with COVID, like everyone else, we're in, in uh, I guess, a bit of a holding pattern in the sense that as we ramp up, as we try to develop these incremental collaborative efforts with the field that we're involved with, which is the older adult network here in San Diego, you know, we've changed course a little bit. We've been convening monthly meetings now with all the senior center directors in an attempt to better understand not only what they're suffering, for lack of a better word, right now yeah. with operations, with efforts, and how they've had to adapt. And it's not only about short-term survival, it's really about long-term survival, um, given the fact they've lost all, you know, as far as charging fees for programs and events, having fundraising events, having annual galas, which are so, you know, these organizations are heavily reliant upon that, that's gone away. And we don't know for how long. So we're working with, with the directors and trying to get a better understanding of what they need and how we can address this messaging to, uh, uh, you know, frankly, what we need to be a larger donor base for even for our, uh, for our own, own sustainability. We're still working on developing uh, energy within the network to, to show them that we are, to be a trusted partner, but also trying to ramp up our own operations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess that is um, a nice place to sort of conclude for now uh, is I heard a lot of folks saying we, you know, the core of what you do is supporting nonprofit organizations in their work. Uh, so how do we really double down on helping them be more connected, collaborative um, and effective? And that means identifying partner funders um, or donors to join in to the cause because, you know, for the most part, none of us is going to be able to fund the entire solution. Um, and even if we could, that's not very much fun. Uh, it's better to have friends. So <laughs> I, I would close um, 
with the invitation to reach out at any time. Uh, you know, our, our role is a connector and a convener. And, you know, sometimes that looks like us having a meeting uh, and, a, and a plan. And sometimes that just looks like us saying, oh, yeah, I know somebody who's interested in that. Let me make a connection for you. Um, or, hey, I know somebody who tried that and failed miserably. I'm sure they'd love to <laughs> debrief with you. You know, so please reach out to us at any time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, I would invite all of us to just take a deep breath and remember, uh, you know, we're in this for the long run and caring for ourselves and our loved ones is important as we continue to do the good work. Um, and I uh, will see you all next time. Uh, please join us at a collaborative meeting. They're open to everybody. So if you have an interest in any of those issue areas, we'd love to see you there. Thank you so much. Happy Monday. Uh, and we'll see you soon.